بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمد الله العلي العظيم ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله النبي الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى ادعوا ربكم تضرعا وخفيا إنه لا يحب المعتدين ولا تفسدوا في الأرض بعد إصلاحها ودعوه خوفا وطمعا إن رحمة الله قريب من المحسنين ويقول الله تبارك وتعالى وقال ربكم ادعوني أستجب لكم صدق الله العظيم We are all created things. We have been created by one creator, one master. He alone is responsible for fulfilling all our needs. No need can be fulfilled until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows it to be fulfilled. And as such, he has taught us how to take from his treasures. Because he possesses all that exists, he owns all that exists. One who turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns to an unlimited resource. One who turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns to someone who gives and gives and gives. His treasures do not decrease. Yamin Allahi Mala. La Dabibuha Nafaqa Mun Sahabu Layu and Nahar. Awaitum Mada and Papa Mundu Khalafa Samawati Wal Ark. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands are full. Spending day and night profusely does not diminish anything from his treasures. Then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asks us that have you thought about how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spent since he created the heavens and the earth? How much has Allah spent? Everything that exists comes from the treasures and the treasury of Allah. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the food that we consume, the animals, the birds, the fish consume, where is all this coming from? All this vegetation and greenery, these trees, these crops, orchards, it's all coming from one source. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spending on his makhluk. And when we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we turn to someone who loves to give and loves those who ask from him. Anyone who turns to makhluk, to any created thing, to any worldly resource, turns to something which is limited and turns to something that will count what they gave you and express their favor upon you for giving it and then get upset if you ask too much or if you ask over and over again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, ask me over and over and over again. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is such that مَن لَمْ يَسْأَلِ اللَّهَ يَطْلَبْ عَلَيْهِ When someone doesn't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah azza wa jal becomes displeased with them. There is no giver, there is no mu'ati like this. And because dua involves submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and turning to Him from the core of our hearts, it has been called the essence of ibadah. Because the essence of ibadah is to turn all our attention to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any distraction. 
to connect all our hopes and aspirations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To humble ourselves in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ud'u rabbakum tadarru'an wa khufya. Call upon your Lord, humbling yourselves, lowering yourselves. Humbling oneself is only permitted in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the human being honor. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us honorable. He does not want us to lower ourselves in front of the makhluk. So there's only one entity that we are supposed to lower ourselves in front of, and that is Allah. Part of Learning about dua is learning how to truly lower ourselves and humble ourselves in front of Allah. You have been hearing about the du'as of the Anbiya salam throughout the evening. The du'a of Yunus salam, La ilaha illa anda subhanaka inni kuntu min al is not even a du'a, it's more like a praise of Allah and an admission of fault. What was he doing? He was humbling himself in front of Allah. He didn't need to say the rest. This was enough. I will not turn to anyone except for you. There is no one worth turning to except for you, O Allah, even in this state. And I am at fault. I am at fault. I am the transgressor. I am from those who have transgressed against themselves. We accepted his call, we responded to his call, and we saved him from that distress. And it wasn't just for him. This is how we rescue all believers. The Prophet taught this dua to the Muslims, and he said, this is for anyone who is in distress, provided that they are fulfilling the basic conditions of dua. And sincerity in dua involves us connecting with what we're saying. People have taken this kalima that is, has been taught to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they use it in their time of difficulty. Families get together and read it over and over again thousands and thousands of times. They have khatams of it. So when a family had a problem and they did this and they recited it collectively thousands and thousands of times and the problem still wasn't removed, they went to one of our great mashayikh, Shaykh Amr al-Hassan rahimahullah. And they said, Shaykh, the Qur'an says this, teaches us this, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us this, and we have read and read and read, but our problem hasn't been removed. So he responded, saying, that yes, because you probably didn't consider yourself a ghalim while you were reading it. In other words, you may have been reading this, but while you're reading it, you're thinking, Inni kuntu min al-dhakirin. Inni kuntu min al-musabbihin. Someone is thinking, Inni kuntu min al-mutasaddiqin. Inni kuntu min al-musallin. Inni kuntu min al-sa'imin. Inni kuntu min al-sadiqin. Inni kuntu min al-sabirin. Inni kuntu min al-mu'atamirin. Inni kuntu min al-hajjin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to genuinely humble ourselves in front of Him. And when we humble ourselves in front of Him, it means that we remove ourselves from any sense of self-importance, status, authority. We remove ourselves from that. And we, are, we become just a weak, sinful slave in front of our true master. Expressing our weakness in front of him.
And the Anbiya salam taught us this. Look at not just the dua of Zakariya salam, but how he made dua. Oh, I am weak, I am old, I am feeble, I have nobody. <coughs> and I haven't been deprived of making dua free from you in this, in this condition. I'm still making dua. This is my blessing. The one thing I have on my side is that I'm asking you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds. Wa khufiyah, secretly, quietly, not announcing it to everyone. al Hasan al-Basir rahmahullah said, that كان المسلم كان المسلمون يجتهدون في الدعاء فلا يسمع لهم صوت لم يكن إلا همسا بينهم وبين ربهم. Speaking about the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم, they would be exerting themselves in dua. No one would know what they're saying. No one would know what is it that they're asking Allah سبحانه وتعالى. It was just a whisper between them and Allah سبحانه وتعالى. And in the same passage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَدْعُوهُ خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا These are all etiquettes, but also conditions of the acceptance of dua. There has to be a fear. A fear of what? A fear of being taken to account for our own mistakes and our own sins. We don't go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a sense of entitlement. Here I am, give it to me. What about my misdeeds? What about my mistakes? So I don't have written something very profound. Say that sometimes we make dua and we say it's not accepted yet, it's not accepted yet. Why is my dua not being accepted? So they wrote that, have we ever paused to think how many commands of Allah have I delayed? That he has not taken me to task for how many of his commandments I've put aside. Sometimes I've ignored them. Sometimes I've forgotten them. Sometimes I've made mistakes about them. Sometimes I've just been completely neglectful about them. Instead, we are trying to call the Khaliq to account even though he says, لا يسأل عما يفعل وهم يسألوا He is not the one who is going to be questioned. He cannot be questioned. They will be questioned. So that sense of fear that yes, I'm asking Allah, but it could be that my own sins become the biggest barrier in the acceptance of this dua. My own mistakes could be the reason why my dua is not accepted or it could be why I'm in this position to begin with. And tama'an, hope, expectations, that no, but His mercy is so great that He can still give me. I am sinful, I am weak, but his mercy is very vast, he can still give me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us what he wants to see in our dua. And dua is so powerful that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us that it benefits from those problems that have descended and those that have not yet descended. Therefore, not to wait for a problem to start making dua. The hadith says that the one who wants Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept his prayers in his time of difficulty. مَنْ أَحَبَّ أَنْ يَسْتَرِيبَ اللَّهُ لَهُ فِي الشِّدَّةِ فَلْيُكْثِرِ الدُّعَاءَ فِي الرَّخَى You want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept your prayers when problems descend, you should be making a lot of dua when there are no problems. You say, yes, this is my slave who turns to me in all his conditions. Because this slave is attached to me. This slave wants to come to me. This slave is constantly approaching me. 
And so we hear, we read from the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. They say that make dua profusely because the door that is knocked frequently is most likely to be opened. Ramadan ibn Samad radiallahu anhu says that one of the big bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this ummah over other ummahs is that for previous ummahs, their prophets were told, their anbiya salam, were told that make dua to me and I will accept your dua. But for this ummah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told all of us, Ud'uni astajib lakum. O followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, make dua to me and I will accept the dua of all of you. That promise that was given to the anbiya alayhi wa is given to every single follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the essence of dua is to humble oneself in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at that moment to remove everything other than Allah from our hearts. It's the essence of ibadah, so it demands tawheed just like every other act of ibadah. That there is nothing, there is no one in our hearts. Forget about distractions at the time of dua. There is nothing present in our hearts when we raise our hands in front of Allah. And the hadith says very clearly, in Allah, لا يقبل الدعاء من قلب الغافر لهم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept the dua of a heart that is negligent, it's distracted, thinking about other things. And there are so many occasions when dua is accepted that it seems like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking for excuses to give us something. Pick up the collections of ahadith and the list goes on and on and on. One sahabi asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Which dua is listened to the most? He says, Jawful layl al-akhir wa dhul salawat al-maktubat. The last portion of the night and after every fad salat. There are hadiths that talk about dua being accepted on the day of Jum'ah. Various riwayat about that from numerous sahaba. Some sahaba said that it's between Fajr and sunrise. Others said that it's from the time that the khutbah starts until salat is over. Others said that it's between Asr and Maghrib on Jum'ah. There are some ahadith that indicate acceptance of dua on the night, the eve of Jum'ah, meaning Thursday night. Acceptance of dua in the gathering of the Muslims. The Sahih Hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ would encourage women to come, even those women that were not praying, they should come for Eid Salat. Why? So they can participate in the dua, wa da'wat al Muslimin, so they can participate in those duas. Duas in the gatherings of Muslims are accepted. Dua after dhikrullah is accepted. Dua after tilawat al Quran is accepted. One hadith says that when you read Quran, after you read Quran, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because a time will come when people will read the Qur'an and ask from people to that Qur'an. Dua after every good deed has a, has a likelihood of being accepted. Dua after giving charity has a higher likelihood of acceptance. Dua after doing some khidma for someone, looking after someone, taking care of their need has a higher likelihood of acceptance. The dua of the musafir is accepted. The dua of the sign is accepted. The dua of the mudloom is accepted. The dua of the mudtar, the person who is in distress, is accepted. Dua of the parents for their children is accepted. Dua of a person who makes dua for another person behind their back is accepted. A person who praises and glorifies Allah and sends salawat on the Prophet and then makes dua, his, his dua is accepted. A person who says Ameen after his dua, his dua is accepted. The list goes on. It's not a matter of will Allah accept my dua or not. It's a matter of will I make dua or not and will I do it in the way that will open up the doors of Allah's treasures. 
One hadith says that man futiha lahu baab dua futiha lahu abwaab jannah. The doors of Allah's mercies are open. Umar radiallahu anhu used to say that I have no concern or no attention to the acceptance of dua. I have concern about whether I got tawfiq to make dua or not because I know the moment I got tawfiq that dua is going to be accepted. Turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all conditions and circumstances. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us dua at every occasion of our lives. We're starting your day. Look at the dua and the ad'iyya of the morning. Evening time comes. He taught us dua for the evening. Waking up, duas for waking up. Going to sleep, duas for going to sleep. Starting your meal, ending your meal. Every aspect, you have a meal at someone's house, make dua for them. Sahaba radiallahu anhu learned from the Prophet sallallahu not just how to make dua, but when to make dua. And they were so eager, they were so enthusiastic about this issue of dua that they would be requesting each other to make dua for them. Each Sahabi is asking the other, make dua for me. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is sending Umar radiallahu anhu off, he's saying, la tansana min du'aika ya ukhay. Brother, don't forget me in your du'as. He told them, Oais al-Qarni is coming. If you can get him to make dua of maghfirah for you, then do so. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu was with Abu Adha radiallahu anhu after the battle of Hunayn. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had appointed him as Amir. Abu Adha radiallahu anhu got injured. An arrow struck him in the knee. He was wounded very severely. And this wound took him to his deathbed. Before he passed away, he requested Abu Musa radiallahu anhu that please convey my salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and request him to make dua al maghfirah for me. And he made Abu Musa radiallahu anhu his naib. You lead the people in my place. When he passed away, Abu Musa radiallahu anhu went to him and he said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, he, re- he sent his salam to you and he requested you for dua. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam first went and made wudu, teaches us another etiquette of dua. To make dua in the state of tahara. This is in the, in the hadith of Sahih Muslim. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went, made fresh wudu, then he raised his hands high and he started making dua for Abu Amr radiallahu anhu. Abu Musa radiallahu anhu was there. He said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, make dua for me as well. So he made dua for him also. So we are the ummah that has been given this great weapon, this great tool of dua. How we use it is up to us. But there is no doubt that a person who starts walking on the path of dua starts walking on the path of nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this dua has to be for all our needs. Not just our worldly needs, but also of the greater and everlasting needs of the akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the ahkam of hajj. What to do, what is the sequence. And then, there is an interval a completely different passage, not related directly to Hajj, but it is related to Hajj. Because one of the great things that we look forward to at Hajj is what? It's Dua. And we go there so that we want to make Dua. Everyone has this intention. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directs us. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقِ There are some people who, even though they're there, what are they making dua for? Just their dunya. It's like this is just a means of me to sort out my affairs. I remember one brother came back, one elderly brother came back from, from Hajj and he says, this time I just made one dua. Just one dua. Everywhere I went, I just made one dua. 
So everyone was sitting around, they were interested in what is this dua that this brother made? He said, I just made dua for a respectful retirement. There's nothing wrong with asking for that. That's fine. But just one dua. There is so much you could have asked. And there are some people that have the tawfiq to make dua for their worldly interests as well as the everlasting needs of qiyamah and akhirah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the first group who are only focused on dunya because that's what they're working for and that's what they're praying for. They have no share in the akhirah. And this second group, they will get a share of what they work for. Nasibun mimma kasabu. They will work for dunya, they will get a share from dunya. They will work for akhirah, they will get a share for akhirah. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ فَأُولَئِكَ كَانَ سَعْلُهُمْ مَشْهُورًا You want akhirah, you have to work for it. You have to do the effort that's required for akhirah. Whatever we are making dua for, are we working for it or not? We want Jannah. Everyone wants Jannah. It needs to be matched with an effort for Jannah. We want the pleasure of Allah. We ask Allah for His pleasure. We need to work for Allah's pleasure. We ask for barakah and risk. We need to make sure we're doing those things that bring us barakah and risk. Otherwise, the Prophet ﷺ tells us about a person who goes to Baytullah and he's holding the curtains of the Kaaba saying, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi. And the angels look at this person in amazement. They say, Mat'amuhu haram. Wa malbasuhu haram. Fa'anna yustajabu li Earnings are for in, from impure sources. The food you've eaten, the clothes you're wearing, the thing that your body has been nourished with, it's all impermissible in sight of Allah. How can your dua be accepted? Sa'ad al Nabi Waqas radiallahu anhu is a very great Sahabi. And in the early days, he requested the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. O Prophet of Allah, make dua that Allah makes me from those people that when they raise their hands, their dua is accepted. The Prophet in response to this dua gave him a piece of advice. He said, Purify your earnings. Purify your risk. Your dua will be accepted. There is a direct relationship between the purity of what we earn and how we earn versus the acceptance of our duas. So those who are eager to have their dua accepted also need to be eager to make sure that there is nothing of any doubtful source coming into them, into their system. There's nothing of any doubtful source coming into their family. And then later on, as is mentioned in numerous ahadith, the dua of Sa'ad radiallahu anhu, unbelievable. On numerous occasions, people, there's a lengthy hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari about a campaign that was carried out to defame Sa'ad radiallahu anhu. In the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, Umar radiallahu went to Iraq to verify and he asked people in the masjids and there was like a silly rumor that he doesn't lead the salat properly. And everywhere that Umar radiallahu went, everyone said, no, we're very happy with him. He's a great person. He's a very, very, you know, pious person. He does everything according to sunnah. And finally, after the investigation, this rumor was traced to one person who had started it all. Of course, Sa'ad radiallahu was exonerated by Umar radiallahu anhu. He says, no, I have, I have no such 
feelings about you that you would do something like that. I know who you are. But Sa'ad radiallahu was very hurt. He said, oh Allah, if this person has lied about me, then take away his eyesight, give him a long, long life, and disgrace him in this world. And that's exactly what happened to that person. Became old, so old that his eyes, his eyebrows were drooping over his eyes. He lost his eyesight. And he would go around teasing young girls in the streets. And people said, what happened to you? He said, Asabatni da'wa to Sa'ad. The dua of Sa'ad reached me, it destroyed me. In the battle of Qadisiya, Sa'ad radiallahu anhu was the proxy Amir. Umar radiallahu anhu maintained control of the armies, of the Muslim armies from a distance. And he used a complex system of messengers to take information, to take the intelligence, and then give instructions. And Sa'ad radiallahu anhu was there to carry out his instructions. Sa'ad radiallahu anhu had a very bad case of sciatic pain. He was in so much pain that he couldn't sit on his horse anymore. So they had occupied a fortress at, at the head of that field, the plain of Qadisiyah. And so he stayed at the top, just reclining, and from there giving instructions as per the orders of Umar radiallahu anhu. They won that battle, afterwards someone teased him. That yes, we won the battle with our blood and sweat, but some people were sitting there reclining on cushions. So Sa'ad al was very hurt. Because لَيْسَ عَلَى الْأَعْمَى حَرَجْ وَلَا عَلَى الْمَرِيْضِ حَرَجْ وَلَا عَلَى الْعَرَجِ حَرَجْ There is no, there is no blame on someone who is physically unable to participate. He said, Oh Allah, you know my condition. If I was indeed excusable, worthy of being excused, then you look after that person. A stray arrow came out of nowhere and struck the person. Battle is over, everyone's kind of gone home, an arrow comes out of nowhere and strikes that person. Cleansing our risk, our system of risk. What are we earning? What are we doing to earn? What ethics and morals are we implementing in the process of earning? It's not just the what, but the how. This has a direct impact on the acceptance of our worships and the acceptance of our du'as. So in this way, we become an ummah that has that has access the true power of this dua and this is something that needs to be practiced individually it needs to be practiced in families and homes what is our dua today the prophet sallallahu has told us that after salat dua is accepted what is our dua like Sometimes we don't even have we don't even have that much zeal that we raise our hands properly. The sunnah of raising the hands is that they should be raised up to the shoulders facing the face. This is the sunnah. Some of us are making dua down here. Hands are down here looking around. Where is the humility? Where is the earnest? Where is the pleading in front of Allah, in the court of the Almighty? Where is that? People weren't even dare to ask their wives for something in that way, looking around here and there. She was like, look at me when you're talking to me. Talk properly. Allah, there's so much for us to learn. Presence of mind, presence of heart. Removal of distractions. Remembrance of Allah. Focus and concentration towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
doing the dhikr of Allah privately in, in great amounts, spending a lot of time in seclusion doing the dhikr of Allah brings power into dua. Obeying the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings power into dua. Being diligent about what we consume brings power into dua. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to everyone. He gives to those who obey him, he gives to those who disobey him, but we don't want to be from those who are constantly, diso constantly disobeying him and then asking him for things. A believer would not be so shameless as to constantly and openly disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then say, give me this. Basically what we're telling is, Telling him is that I'm not going to do what you want me to do, but you better do what I want you to do. And it doesn't work like that. That's why after thana on Allah and salawat on the Prophet وسلم, we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. We beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness for our mistakes and our sins, and then we ask our need from Allah. And to include as many people in our dua as we possibly can because the dua we make behind someone's back is accepted. And dua is something that even if we don't see the effects of it, its effects have taken place. We should know that. That the moment I've made dua, it's doing something for me. One hadith says that a bala some kind of affliction is coming down from the heavens. A person makes dua, the dua goes up and stops it. This bala is coming down, dua goes up and says, sorry, you can't come down. It's like, no, I've been sent down. Sorry, you can't. They sit there debating and arguing. I need to go down. No, you can't go down. I need to go down. No, you can't go down. They sit there wrestling with each other until Yawm al qiyamah the dua postpones it. So we don't know what effect our dua has had. All we do know is that dua has had an effect. Either we will get exactly what we're asking for, or we'll get something else in its place, probably something that's better for us, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use it to remove a problem that was coming, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use it to give us something much, much bigger on the day of judgment. Dua is accepted. Every dua that we make from the sincerity of our hearts is accepted. We should know this. So the Prophet ﷺ tells us, When you make dua, have yaqeen that my dua is accepted. These are some reflections from the Book of Allah Azzawajal and from the Sunnah of His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala give us tawfiq and make us worthy of our du'as being accepted and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answer our prayers and the prayers of our brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove our afflictions and cure our sick and forgive those who have passed and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open up the doors of khair for us and for the entire Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hala wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakana nabiyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. As-salamu alaykum.